Right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to have you all joining us tonight for the tw uh, 2022 annual meeting of the China Christianity Studies Group. Um, and wherever you are, whether it is evening, afternoon, morning, um, or somewhere in between, uh, it is wonderful to see you all. Um, due to a couple of security things we have in place for right now, uh, um, if you have any questions or um, you know, com comments, you can definitely put them um, in the kind of direct chat to the moderator or the co-hosts. Uh, we can definitely do that. Uh, currently, we are uh, having everyone muted, so just wanted to let you know in case you were looking for the unmute button, uh, things are kind of set for now, but we will certainly have time for discussion discussion um, during the conversations. Um, so again, uh, on behalf of the CCSG, welcome, welcome. Uh, it's really good to see you. Um, I'm Joseph Ho uh, of Albion College, and the assistant director um, is Nathan Ferris of Bates College. Uh, and we have a wonderful uh, set of uh, presenters here tonight, um, or again, tonight for me, um, but other times for you, um, that we are looking forward uh, to, to hearing from. And uh, at the end of the presentations and Q&A, uh, we will also have a business meeting um, to decide uh, kind of the, the directions and plans for the CCSG moving forward. So I hope that um, if you're interested, you would like, you can certainly stay for the business meeting afterward as well. So uh, to kind of get us started for uh, today, um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Alex Mayfield of Boston University um, to give his presentation, which is entitled uh, A Demonstration of the China Historical Christian Database. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I just want, to, just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, there's so many familiar faces and I know so many people who have contributed to this project. Um, and so just thanks for being here and I'm glad we'll get to update everyone um, on the status of it. Um, so today I'm going to quickly kind of give a, just a brief overview for those who aren't familiar with the project, what it is. Um, and then we're going to dive into a quick demonstration of, of kind of the front end interface of our database. Um, so let me, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and, and dive in. So, um, so we'll be talking about the database today and in the project. So I think I, I kind of outlined what we're doing already here. So, and then we will end the, the, the presentation with a discussion on like kind of what comes next. Um, so just starting with that overview, the CHCD is a project which uh, quantifies and visualizes um, Christianity in modern China, so from 1550 to 1950. And we do that by recording known people, institutions, organizations, and events in Chinese history. Um, so it's a, a very large project. Um, and it's kind of one of those projects that will probably keep going for as long as we can keep it going. Um, but we have some really great goals and have already accomplished a lot of amazing things with the help of so many people. So um, our database, um, just a few things about it. It's a relational and a geographic graph database. Now, what that means is um, this isn't necessarily a biographical database, which might be familiar with something like the, uh, you know, well-known Ricci um, roundtable database or things like that. Um, or other biographical projects that are out there. This is a database that really focuses on relationships and relationships to geography. Um, and so that's a huge part of the project itself. You can see the data structure on the, the right-hand side of the screen. Um, but the other sides of it really are driven by partnerships and, and student-driven data collection over the past two years, which is a huge aspect of the part pro uh, of the project itself, really building these bridges between different places around the world. Um, and then lastly, it's the front end user interface. So our big goal of our project was not just to create another database project, which is fun and you can do cool things with if you know how to do data you know, science or, or digital history, but to create something that students and people who are maybe not as familiar with uh, digital history or the, the tools of digital history, that they can actually reap the fruits of this project. So that's what we're looking at today. And what you can do with this project um, in its form, and whether you use it the, the, the front end interface or you take the download the data and do something really unique with it yourself. I um, mean, this is useful for basic research, just finding out who was where and when. Um, or you can do things like network and spatial analysis, longitudinal comparative studies, um, and also use it in the classroom. You know, students should be able to explore some of these, these features rather easily. Um, and you can in, use it in the classroom to help people understand you know, themes and trends within Chinese uh, history. Uh, so 
Real quick, before I dive into the front end user interface, I kind of want to give everyone an update on where we stand. So this release of the information you see here, this is what makes up our database. Um, the things outlined in green are the things that are cleaned and included in the database, the things that you will be seeing today. Um, and if you logged on, you could see right now. Um, and the things in white are the things which are on my computer right now being actively cleaned and then will be input um, so within the next uh, next couple of weeks. So we will be fully live and functioning, um, hopefully by the end of the month, um, but by June for sure. Um, so right now at its current size, the database features 20, over 27,000 individuals, over 5,000 institutions, 500 organizations, 87,000 location records, and uh, 12,000 personal relationships, those people-to-people -people relationships. So it's a really rich, um, interconnected uh, trove of data. Um, and this first release really focuses on data that we could get from missionary groups. So there are a lot of Chinese people actually in the database, but they're usually, um, we only have maybe their Romanized uh, name. So it's a little bit limiting, but that's something we'd like to take care of for in the future. Um, and it's also we focus on digitally available sources. Um, so most of these things were things that we could either download or scan or have scanned, um, and we'd be running through complete scans, uh, complete runs of large corpuses as much as possible. So uh, we can talk about that later in the Q&A if you'd like, but just wanted to put that on the screen so you can screenshot it if you want and hold our feet to the fire if this is not what comes out in a week or two, um, but it will be. <laughs> um, so without further ado, I'd love to dump, jump into the data to the actual front end and just kind of review some of the things. So just again, uh, our goals here were accessibility. We wanted this to be intuitive and learner oriented. So we want people to be able to really explore the data and understand what it does. And we have a lot of features that I'll be reviewing. So I'm gonna switch my screen really quick. Uh, new sh and we'll dive in. So this, if you logged into our uh, new database, uh, which we will have live soon, um, this is what you'll see, your home screen. Our database features um, you know, a lot of different things. Um, so it is fully, uh, I guess you'd say bilingual, but with both traditional characters and simplified characters and English. And then there's links on the front page where you can go find documentation to better understand the shape of the data, how the database is constructed, uh, learn more about just the project's history, and even to download the data. We will have it available in multi -format, multiple formats for people to utilize however they prefer. Now, the, the real way that most people probably interact with the database will be coming here, which is to the Explore tab, and just simply, you know, searching. So, for instance, um, this is a Lucene full text search, which means it's fuzzy. Um, so, for instance, if I'm looking for Eleni and I misspell it, um, well, I will probably still get Julio Eleni. Um, so it's a, it's a great way. And that's really important because, um, you know, as you might know, I'm sure all of you are, spelling get really funky in Chinese and we're working in different languages. So it's nice so to have those. And we also recorded multiple spellings if, we, if people have different variants in their name. So it's really, it should be really easy to find who you're looking for most of the time. So once you're here this page, we have filters on the side, which allow you to kind of filter and, and reduce the results if you don't get what you want immediately. And those are all dynamic. So I could just get only the Catholics, get those who are Orthodox, for instance, if you were looking for Alexei Agafonov, um, you could find him that way. Um, and all of these, again, uh, really are based upon what you actually have showing up in your search. So if you click on someone, um, it pops up with a, a little screen that shows all of the relationships that they have in the database. So we can see Eleni was in Shanghai, Macau, various places around China and Nanking. Um, and he had all of these different relationships. And you could also click here, show additional information and find out different things about him. So that he's you know, Italian, uh, that he is male, some different Chinese names, alternate Chinese names. You could find notes, for instance. This information comes from De Hearn a uh, very famous 1973 uh, a volume. And uh, we actually, for a lot of the ones from DeHaan, we'll have full text English translations because this is what our students did as they tried to get this information. So it's very useful to access that source in particular. Um, so you can do a lot here. Um, and just again, to d demonstrate some of these features, if I type in Nankin Mission, you know, you're going to find other ones, general area of Nankin, you're gonna find different things that many processes we're at, but again, you can see different filters showing up. So you have corporate entities, which would be like organizations and things like that, uh, different tr traditions being, uh, you know, uh, represented. So if I don't want all these people who show up, I can just filter it and get only the institutions and non-keen missions right there at the top. So it's rather easy to find what you, what you want, um, thankfully, with, because this is a kind of leucine graph-based search. It's very powerful. I will admit, though, it's not as great in Chinese. Um, unfortunately, that's just the nature of how the Lucene engine works. Um, but perhaps we can find a better way in the future. 
Um, so let's go back to Eleni real quick to kind of understand some of the features that you might get in the database. Again, I can just type Eleni uh, and he will show up uh, using the first results. So it's going to give us the thing that matches the best. So clicking Eleni, uh, you can find all the relationships here. And what's great about this is it's kind of like a social network application. You could click the Peking mission, and then you're going to look and find whoever's been actually recorded as being at the Peking mission. And you can then go you know, sort through and kind of explore the social network uh, of the people that he might have known. Um, and then you have a breadcrumb, so you don't get too lost along the way if you keep kind of following yourself down the rabbit hole. Um, What's also really fun about this is you can, there's buttons here at the top. And I, I want to show, you know, you can click there. And once you find your person, we can click a map. And the database will give us a map of all his known locations. Um, and so this is really great. So you can, you can look and explore a little bit of, of where he might have been around, at least as best as we can tell. Um, some of the places are a little hard to locate. So these would be kind of approximate locations for many people. Um, but you can get a sense of, you know, his, of where Lanny went, what he did, who he knew. Um, and as you explore this map, um, you can, they have pop-ups here, which you can click to learn more and you get back to that pop-up. Um, but this is really useful for things if you want to do more. So let's say you aren't interested in just Eleni, but you want to know about, you know, all the Jesuits. Um, so we can type in Society of Jesus, or I typed Jesuits. It gave me Society of Jesus because it's a kind of a match name. Um, and then I can type in, you know, Italy. So I want to find all of Eleni's friends uh, or who he might, all his uh, countrymen, if you will. So I could put that, that query in. And, oh, let me clear my results. Apologies. Let me clear my results. I forgot to clear my results, so it gave me the wrong stuff. So here we go. So I type in Society Jesus, Italy, submit, and it's going to take a little bit because there's several, but not too long. And there we have a map of all the Italian Jesuits. Um, if I type in all the Jesuits, uh, as you know, there's a lot of them. It takes maybe a couple seconds to pull that map up. But it, again, you can then start pulling maps of all kinds of groups. You know, this, these are the Jesuits that we're looking at now, but we have. Um, you know, all different Protestant groups. The CIM map, for instance, takes forever to load because there's just thousands and thousands of people who show up through, through that organization. But there's lots of ways that you can kind of sort. You can do things by different years and get and, and then create kind of time-stamped maps to understand how organizations might have grown in China or changed over time or responded to, to various um, incidents. So it's a really powerful tool here. Um, and I think let's let's try to explore someone else quickly. Um, so we, here we have Prospero in, in Torcerta, who is, is a, not super well-known, but he is a well-known. He, he had a very important career, vice provincial, for instance. Um, and so, you know, we can look at him, but let's say we want to know a bit more about, about who we actually knew. So we can actually click the network graph map, click that, and it will, it'll pop us over to this view, the network view, where we can actually then generate a map of who... Uh, Prospero actually knew. Now we'll see if it works. We're still in bug fixing mode, so if something goes wrong, I apologize. Um, or if my computer internet delays. Let's see. Doesn't seem like it wants to work for us right now. No, oh, that's important. That's that's a shame. So again, like I said, we're working in active bug fixing mode. So let's see if we can find him this way. Sometimes the links don't work. Anyway, yes, uh, this is what you love when you're doing a technology demonstration, when the technology that you're actively developing uh, doesn't like to work for you. So let's see if we can, uh, it's also sometimes my internet doesn't load up super well. So let's try again, one more last time. Oh, I see what's happening. So we have a couple connection issues real quick. Let me fix something one second. So these are the sort of things that we are working out in the next few weeks. Um, so let me see if I can pull up a map for us all here in the final minutes of this demonstration. All of my colleagues uh, conveniently were not able to, they're, they're nice and enjoying their time in Italy right now as I uh, get to show you all of our technology. <laughs> Here we go. Yes. Okay. Let me share this screen. I think I had a connection issue. I'm sorry about that. All right. So let's do Prospero again. Prospero. 
Is it working now? Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Okay, good. Well, we'll do Eleni just because apparently, I don't know if I try, start typing Prospero and everything falls apart. So here we go. So we have Eleni. We'll look at Eleni's map. So Eleni was a well-known Jesuit. We can see some of the institutions that he's involved in and who he's connected to. This is an ego map with him at the big center. And we can see his map, his connections as he put, goes further out. So for instance, if we go two degrees out, this will take a second to load. Um, it will um, load a much larger map of Eleni's network. Um, and you can see who he might have known. And again, this is constrained by his years in China or his years of life, whatever dates we have, there'll be the constraining factors in the map. And you can then begin to kind of create your own uh, maps based on individuals or institutions. Um, again, some of these queries can take a long time because once you start going very far, you can begin to see it's a very interconnected database. But Eleni here has um, some, some direct connections institutions. And even I think if we include an event, you can see who some of the ships that Eleni might have been on with other people. Um, for instance, the voyage of the uh, Nuestro Señor uh, had several other people on it. And so these are people he might have actually been on the ship with. And you can see how they're connected. So as you can see, we're still working out a few bugs um, as we kind of get through the, the interface. But we are right about there. Um, and, I just, uh, and this is what the project will be um, kind of the, the front end that most people will see. So they can actually kind of explore the data, see how people are connected, um, and, and then begin to generate maps they might be able to use for presentations at the classroom or things like that. Um, so that is, the, um, what, that is the front end, um, a very quick demo of it I mean, in its current state. Thanks for bearing with the um, technical difficulties. And, uh, and just want to share a little bit about where we're going next. So we have, I, I showed you that map of the, uh, the, of the sources that we're using. And what, what we're looking to do in the future is, uh, you know, bug fixing, as you saw, querying, kind of tuning some of the queries, making a bit more, there's more information that we'd like to display that the database actually contains already, like ordination dates for Catholics. Um, and even having more charts and graph visualizations that we've developed through some partnerships. Um, and uh, data goals, increasing some of our Chinese and Catholic nodes is a very big goal. Um, and then hoping to even integrate things like major publications into the database and seeing who wrote and what publications and things like that. So we have a few things that we are um, kind of focused on and we'll be working on in the future. Um, and so, yeah, the, the database is growing. It's going to continue to grow, but we will have a big release here in just a few uh, weeks. It's a very exciting time. Thanks for uh, your time and bearing with. Alex, thank you so much. That's fantastic. I mean, such a rich resource and we're certainly looking forward to working with it. And I'm sure many of us here are also very excited uh, to work with this. And as a quick uh, technical announcement, um, this meeting is being recorded. So in case you were looking at the slides and want to go back and you know, check anything, the, the file will be available for us um, after the meeting concludes. Uh, I also, also forgot to mention, I was so excited for all the presentations to start. I forgot to mention, I got another thing. Um, in, in case of any technical uh, intrusions or difficulties, um, if the meeting suddenly logs off, then just wait a couple minutes and rejoin us. Um, but uh, Dr. Ferris is, is working on the, uh, the back end with the, uh, the security. But it's, again, wonderful presentation. Now, if anyone has any questions or con comments, um, we have a few minutes here for Dr. Mayfield. So if you'd like to, to chime in, um, now, is, now is your chance. I have a question for Alex. So yeah. Alex, um, is this database open, open access or, um, or does the institution have to pay the subscription fee or? No, who, this is going to be. Yeah, great question. No, this database is open access. Um, the data is free, gonna be, going to be free to download um, in its various releases. Um, and this front end interface is um, on, uh, online will be online to the public um, in just a matter of weeks. Um, so yes, it'll be free to use. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for your great work. Yeah, thank you.
I'll jump in really briefly. Um, being married to someone who works on software developments, um, curious about the long-term stability of this yeah. site because it is such a great resource and we all have those moments where we are looking up an older resource and find that the link is mm -hmm. dead or we can't redirect to something. Yeah. Um, what things are in place to make sure that this will kind of ensure the long-term stability of this site? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've tried to create a sustainability plan for the long term and several different avenues. Um, you know, first being uh, simply that we have the data available in lots of formats so that we will have the data exportable. We have a backup file people can download and use it in this format. We will have CSV files that people can take and then implement into a, a traditional SQL database. Um, so, and, and just the bare brass tacks, the data will be available and not lost and are, are, are hard to access at any point. So if something does happen, if this beautiful interface crashes or we don't have the money anymore to develop it or just goes obsolete, um, we can always just spin up or just put that CSV into something much more traditional and then spin it up and, and access that data. So in terms of the data itself, we will be able to access it. However, um, you know, whatever happens to this interface, this interface, um, you know, in our specific database um, kind of infrastructure, we opted with something called a graph database and, and a, specifically a platform called Neo4j, um, which is kind of a cutting edge uh, platform, which is still in development, still very much being uh, lots of uh, tech, technology companies have invested in this because graph databases seem to be a much more efficient way to crunch data. So a lot of large data companies are interested in it. And so there's a lot of growing support for it. We, we think it'll keep going on for a long time. Um, so in terms of just the, the sort of sustainability there, we believe this platform will keep going for quite a long time. This interface itself, the um, JavaScript one, um, this, and that's a real, op, you know, developing software is a real thing and keeping it up to date is, is a challenge. So this is a React JavaScript application. So we are developing it on the, the newest thing that we can. Um, I'm developing it. So this is like, what you just saw was me, um, essentially. And so uh, as long as I'm around, as long as I don't get it by a bus, uh, theoretically, we will keep developing it as much as we can and keep it up, up to date. So I imagine it'll probably reach certain uh, points we will have to update things or keep it going. Um, but this is the nature of any sort of digital project, right? You have these challenges. Um, so we've tried to have these different avenues to ensure something will continue to exist and nothing will be lost um, as much as we can. So. Fantastic. Other questions, thoughts, comments for Dr. Mayfield? So I encourage anyone to, again, if you have questions that come up after the meeting or during the meeting, um, please do reach out to, uh, to me, to, uh, to Nathan Ferris, um, to uh, Dr. Mayfield, of course, um, and perhaps, you know, if you have thoughts about how to, you know, um, change or even improve or expand this database, you know, because there's a lot of things I'm sure that are still uh, in the works, you know, please reach out to us and we can uh, certainly put you in touch uh, with, with Alex and others who are working on the CHCD. Um, but again, this is so exciting. My goodness. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so next up we have Dr. Annika Stassen from Indiana Wesleyan University. And Dr. Stassen uh, will be speaking on Watchman Ni nee and Wang Mingdao's conceptions of Christian marriage in China. Dr. Stassen. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I just feel really lucky to be one of the people talking, especially because I'm very new to the study of Chinese history. So thank you so much for, for giving me time. And um, I look forward to your comments on what I have to present. Um, so just a little bit of background. I've always been interested in the question, is Christianity good for women? Um, and my current research project focuses on Christian marriage. And I wanna know how 20th century converts to Christianity in Africa and Asia approached marriage. Uh, so a very large project, probably will take me the rest of my life to complete. Uh, so I'm interested in, especially if Christians in these regions conceived of specific roles for men and women, and if their vision for marriage was seen as liberating or oppressive for women. Um, as an American Christian, much of my own making sense of gender roles has taken place within a wider evangelical debate. On one side of the debate stand the complementarians who believe that the Bible commands husbands 
to carry more of the responsibility for leadership and decision making within the family. And they call wives to submit to the husband's leadership. And then on the other side of that debate stand the egalitarians. And these evangelicals do not believe that husbands should have more authority in the marriage than wives. Um, so as I looked at the material, which I was able to access from Wang Ming Dao and Watchman Nee, I was struck by how egalitarian their vision seemed to be, if you want to use that American evangelical language. Neither one of these people, to me, seemed to be singling out the husband as being the leader in the marriage or has, as having more responsibility for making decisions. And I found this especially surprising because of what I had read previously about Watchman Nee. When I was working on my book, Women in the Mission of the Church, I read about how even though a woman, Dora Yu, had brought Watchman Nee to faith, Nee later read John Nelson Darby's arguments against women's leadership and decided that women should not teach men. And so from that point on, um, my understanding is that that was his position on that topic. So my question was, why did Watchman Nee require women to submit to male leadership in the church, but not in the family? So what I'm gonna to present to you is just a summary of what I've gleaned so far from reading a series of talks that he gave on Christian marriage in 1950. And then I'll also be presenting a little bit of Wang Min Dao's theology from some of his sermons in the 30s and 40s. Um, in terms of what Christian family life should look like, the first thing that both Wang and Ni taught was that Christian family has a theocentric, uh, theocratic structure. So Watchman Ni talked about both spouses being totally given to the Lord, and Wang Ming Dao said, husband and wife fear God together, and this is the first principle for maintaining a long-lasting and happy family life. For Wang Ming Dao, the second two principles for maintaining happy family life were to love each other and to respect each other. He said the husband should be willing to share all that he has with the wife. And Wang regularly described husbands and wives as co-workers. Um, I think Wang's life story helps to fill in a bit of his marriage or his vision of marriage. He had many struggles in his early married life. He and his wife were of different temperaments, which caused discord. Plus his sister and his wife, sorry, his sister and his mother did not like his wife. And Wong found it so difficult to navigate his conflicting loyalties um, that he actually contemplate, contemplated suicide. Another problem he faced was that his wife would apparently correct him in public, which was embarrassing to him. And sometimes she would put her hand over his mouth or pat his leg to indicate that he was speaking incorrectly. And Wong doesn't seem to have ever condoned his wife's approach. He continued to think that the best thing to do is to just admonish someone alone, but he did recognize that his wife's behavior helped to illuminate his own quick temper and boldness of speech and made him less likely to say presumptuous things without proper research. Those are his words. So Wong said that his wife helped him to see his own sin. Before I got married, I felt that my love was small, was not small, but after living with my wife for many years, I feel more and more like a selfish person. Um, Wong said that even though he and his wife <clears throat> had been through a long period of friction in the past, we have nevertheless always trusted each other. We do not lie to each other and we harbor no suspicion toward one another. There's nothing between us that we hide. Um, he constantly uses the Chinese term uh, fu qi, husband, wife, and I should mention, I don't speak Sp uh, Chinese. I'm depending on help, helpful people in my life to help me get at some of these ideas. Um, so he tells, he tells spouses, um, he uses this term to emphasize the mutuality. But I'm particularly interested in how he talks about Ephesians 5, um, because this is this famous headship, husband's headship in marriage passage. And he says, a man shall not demand obedience from his wife. He will receive it if he tries to love her. A wife need not ask her husband to love her, but will receive his love if she submits herself to him. If the husband waits until his wife becomes obedient to him before he loves her, and the wife waits until the husband becomes obedient to her before he loves her, then the relationship between husband and wife will become worse and worse. Um, Wong challenges the idea that the man is deserving of all the authority at home. He says that many husbands think that because they work hard and make money outside the home, they deserve infinite authority at home. Wong tells these husbands that their wives are doing all kinds of things, serving parents, raising children, taking care of all kinds of things. 
So husbands take half of the burden, he says, and wives bear the other. Neither can live without the other. It's hard to say who's bigger or smaller, who is more or less important. If a husband understands this, the family will have more happiness, is what he says. Okay, let's move on to Watchman Nee. Um, nee said that in Christian homes, quote, there is no question as to who should be the head and who should obey. Um, now, as I said before, my own framework is the complementarian egalitarian debate within American evangelical um, churches. So when I read these words, I was totally taken aback. I expected uh, Nee to really affirm the husbands as the clear head of the family and the wives needing to submit to ma male leadership. But instead he said, there's no question who should be the head and who should obey. Instead, both will say that Christ is the head and they will both obey him. Um, so I found this very interesting. And then uh, lots of his ideas I found to be really compelling. Um, nee says that sometimes what happens in families is that the wife or husband will argue um, because they want to save face. It has nothing to do with right or wrong. Um, but he says in a Christian marriage, both can lose their faces before the Lord. Both can confess their faults before the other. Um, he highlights the humility and vulnerability and trust. Um, when he taught his coworkers in this 1950 talk about uh, Ephesians 5, he didn't emphasize hierarchy or gendered roles in marriage. Um, here's Here's one of the things he said. He says, when God put two person together as husband and wife, his intention is that there be submission and love between the two. He has no intention for them to discover each other's faults or to correct each other. God has not made you a teacher or a master. None of the husbands are the teachers of their wives and none of the wives are the masters of their husbands. No one needs to correct her husband and no one needs to correct his wife. So I think it's significant that he tells both spouses that they're gonna be tempted to dominate. And he tells both spouses that they should not set themselves up as a teacher or a master over the other. Um, he tells both spouses they have to accommodate each other and change at least half of everything they do. Um, and he also has this interesting idea about protecting freedom in marriage. And he says in many homes, wives do not have any rights. In other homes, husbands do not have any rights. And he says, these families are bound to have problems. Um, he compa compares some husbands and some wives to a jailer. And he says, no one can love a jailer. If you take away a person's freedom, you can't expect them to love you. Um, and so basically every time I see him talking to husbands and wives, I see him saying the same thing to both. I don't see him saying one thing to, to the husbands and another thing to the wives. Um, and so I, I just found that very interesting. Another piece I found interesting um, was the way in which he said that you should be careful not to ma marry someone with an incompatible personality to your own. And it, to us today, that seems like obvious advice. Um, but when I was recently talking with Gloria Tsang, she said that he was actually doing something new when he was emphasizing these compatible personalities. Um, and she, she said, by emphasizing communication and mutual help between spouses, Nee overturned the traditional expectation that the wife was to serve her husband and her parents-in-law while the husband provided materially for her. And she said it was a profoundly egalitarian, albeit subtle and understated cultural shift. So basically, I just didn't find Watchman Nee and Wang Ming Dao making female subordination a prominent marker of Christian homes. Um, rather than seeking to prop up male authority, their marital theology challenged husbands to cultivate humility and to learn to adapt to their wife. And they emphasized mutual submission, love, respect, vulnerability, and trust more than gendered roles. Um, and I guess the reason I find this to be uh, particularly compelling um, is that in the 2000s, um, conservative American theology began flowing into China, the very stuff that I grew up with. Um, which advocated husbands needing to lead and wives needing to submit, and this being the definition of Christian marriage, a clear hierarchy with husband as the leader and responsible for um, having the authority. And the popular books in China on Christian marriage today, at least my understanding, is that they're books by Tim Keller, um, an American, and Andrew Yuan, a Chinese, um, but both are these books that advocate male headship and female submission. Um, so my understanding is that the, the vision in house churches today 
um, because of this influx um, of more conservative theology from America, my understanding is that um, house churches today are far more restrictive to women in their marriage theology than the kind of marriage theology promoted by both Wang Ming Dao and Watchman Nee. So I find that to be an interesting um, trajectory um, and one that I'd be curious to hear people's thoughts about. Thank you, Dr. Stassen. Um, and lots to think about here with theology and culture and history. And it's great that we have people in this room who work on theology and gender and history um, in the Chinese Christian context. So uh, I think we can, you know, we have some time to kind of open the floor again to any comments, questions, thoughts um, that might be interesting, useful to Dr. Stassen. Um, and actually, if I don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with one question um, for Dr. Stassen, and and then we'll certainly we'll have everyone else um, ch ch jump in. What did the wives write? Mm. Is is there a sense that they accepted, pushed back, modified? Um, these types of views uh, in terms of what you found so far? Yeah, what I found so far is I, I haven't found anything written by the wives. Um, so of course, that's always part of the problem is trying to read, read between the lines there. But also, I'm at the very beginning of, of a really long project. So yeah. Which is exciting and challenging all at once. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, back back to the floor for anyone who has thoughts, questions, comments. Uh, I have a question, actually, if if I may. <laughs> Definitely. Right. Okay. So th this is a great topic. A great topic. Um, uh, I, as far as I know, you're the very first person that's ever thought about Watchman Nee and Wang Mingdao in terms of this sort of idea of marriage theology and how they how they place genders within with the confines of marriage. So my question is really this, and it's it's because. Um, Watchman Nee was born in something like 1903, I think, and, and just about when he is being raised in China. And I, I asked this question because on my desk is this book called Fu Nu Jia Shun. It's Chinese. So it's, it's, it's a significant, I think, part of Watchman Nee's life because this particular book published about the time of his birth was really popular in 30s, 40s China. And the entire book is, it argues for a Chinese Confucian sense of the of the dominance of of the of the husband. Mm. So I, my only question is, is or my comment then is, it's fascinating that Watchman Nee and Wang Ming Dao are really, you use the word overturning, um, sort of Chinese expectations of ma marriage hierarchy. I, I would I would guess that Watchman Nee is reading these texts that are the kind of these primers, these qi meng, that are being passed out for most young Chinese males and females in, in China at that time. So I guess my, my thought really is, is um, how much how much is, is how much is he responding to? Here's my question or thought: How much is he responding to Chinese cultural expectations, um, Christian expectations? Because both of them are strongly arguing for a kind of patriarchal structure, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, here's my thing. He must have been unpopular, right, uh, among many, many Chinese people that he knew and, and, and grew up with. And I just sort of have you thought of that, um, the, the pressures of his Chinese context and his Christian context, um, sort of ask my question, really. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's one of the things that I found so interesting, because like, it's exactly what you said, that he's not just overturning Chinese cultural expectations, but also like the missionary expectations, that there was that hierarchy. And that's the piece that I always find really interesting. And I think other people in the room could speak more to the, the historical context in China, because you all know more about that. But for me, as kind of a person coming from many different studies of, of wider cultural situations in different contexts, what I'm always interested in um, is that some of those initial times where people in a new cultural context are encountering the stories of Jesus and working out what they have to say to marriage um, 
And I, th I feel like often what happens in those situations is that it is this liberating type of movement for women in terms of equal equaling out some of that hierarchical situation. And then as the movement gets going longer then those those hierarchical arrangements come back. Um, so maybe the fact that he is coming into this faith and, and having it be be new and sort of a revival situation for him, even though there is wider, like Jennifer had written about, wider history of Christians in his family, but but he himself, the kind of making it his own in a time, I feel like there is that egalitarian thrust in those moments of relating. But the the primer that you held up then, that is not a Christian text. That was just like a text that was given wider. Yeah, it was just a, I mean, th this is actually the, the, a collection of primers that most um, males would have read anywhere okay. from 1905, 1911, really, to the 1940s. And it includes, well, there are lots of sections here that include sort of the roles of men and women in marriage. Um, and I think, I think Nee, my personal opinion is that Nee is just rejecting that. But um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question because he's essentially eschewing his own culture in some ways, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We have uh, yeah. two other hands raised. If we can go with Jonathan Seitz and then Tom Riley and then, and then Jennifer, if you'd like to chime in after, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. This is a great presentation. I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, I wanted to offer one parallel. Like I studied the first ordained Protestant pastor, Liang Fa, and part of his story is his first wife died. He has a second wife that runs away and then he marries near the end of his life a third time. And it's unclear kind of like the, like what the faith is of the second and third spouses, but it's something almost nobody discusses. So I would also be, I think it would be interesting to see kind of like the, ex you know, those, those kind of things that people don't talk about. And then my, my question is kind of about the, I, th I, I, I hope that you have some kind of discussion of extended family also, because I, I am a little nervous about like uh, bringing this very kind of 20th century U.S. complementarianism. Mm -hmm. And then also, which comes out of our own, like a very specific understanding of the family. So I think like often when I see discussions of, of Chinese Christianities and, and marriage, one of the big topics is sort of extended family and marrying out and marrying in and relatives and in-laws and all those kind of pieces. So I just, I just think it's a, I think it's a great topic and I'm, I, I can see how it would take a lifetime to, 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 to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're just saying you want to see more, um, more mention of those extended family how you, how you handle like within the broader context like because it's a yeah. very binary like a man and a woman but then there's this there's this broader context where like i would assume most of the cultural pieces still stay in p place about bride price and in-laws and all of those other pieces and i'd assume most of the time it's christians marrying christians but i don't know that you know like mm -hmm. it's like there's i'd be really curious like who people like those those kind of like the the side pieces to the main topic i just think it would be interesting mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah yeah and one of the things that i've been interested in too in that is um is the emphasis on the husband wife relationship um, and so even if those wider relationships are still very much are part of a couple's experience they're hearing from the Christians and they're they're discovering on their own like this this call to somehow prioritize that husband wife relationship and obviously working that out what that looks like is is difficult and varied but but I have found that to be interesting in how it differs um, from what previously would have been the case. I actually think yeah. I had my order out of like kind of a little bit out of order. Jennifer, you want to go ahead and then we'll go with Tom um, and then and we'll move on. But that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, um, fascinating. Uh, you know, I wish we I had known you when I was writing my book. Uh, but I think it might be um, interesting for you to examine Watchman Nee's own marriage yeah. uh, to charity, um, because it was a love marriage. I mean, uh, there were many people who very publicly through like, ads in the newspaper were trying to convince him not to marry her. And um, he basically went ahead with it. Uh, and just if you want to file this away, you know, her relatives are, are you know, there are many of them still around in mm -hmm. the United States. So, um, you know, you can, we can share that 
okay. contact information, but it, you know, it might be interesting to know if the family of Charity has any of her writings or letters or things yeah. like that. Yeah, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. That would be so cool. Yeah. Excellent suggestion. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Oops. Oh, I, sorry, Tom, I think you're muted again. Okay, that should be good. Um, no, I was gonna say, uh, there's a few ex very famous examples. Uh, Song Mei Ling, of course, the uh, wife of Chiang Kai-shek, uh, their marriage was kind of, you know, a symbol of modern China, right? And uh, she, of course, was educated at Wellesley College. And, uh, and actually, her father had made sure that all his daughters were educated in the United States. So that's kind of impressive. Also, I, I read something along the lines, there is some kind of magazine on Christian marriage, Christian family. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, I don't think it's, it's, it may be in Chinese, but uh, you know, there is something from the 1930s and 40s that, that's out there. And maybe somebody here would know more about that than I do. And then finally, uh, you know, there was also the example of Jinling College, which was the women's college in Nanjing. And, you know, a number of those women uh, had a very strong sense of uh, vocation and uh, vocational calling and all that. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I found in some previous research, too, that was so interesting was the number of those women that went to those colleges and were some of the first, you know, educated women mm. and how they chose so many of them not to get married. Mm. That also is just so different from what you see in other, especially American evangelical context. But um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And if anybody does have in information on that magazine, um, that would be great. This is excellent. I'm looking forward to the project that emerges from the questions and conversations that we're having now. And certainly, we can keep uh, keep in touch and continue these these conversations. Um, so we're moving on now to uh, Dr. Zixi Wang um, at uh, Shantou University. Um, uh, Dr. Wang will be speaking to us uh, on a convert to social Christianity from the start, uh, YMCA, mm -hmm. social gospel internationalism, and the conversion of Wu Yaozong. Dr. Wang. Thank you, Joseph. Um, good evening or good morning, dear colleagues. Um, it's my pleasure to present at the CCSG a group uh, for the very first time. Uh, as shown on my slide, um, the title, the main title of my presentation has changed a little bit. And now the title is uh, A Convert to Evangelical Liberalism, a YMCA, a Social Gospel Internationalism, and the conversion of Yao Zhong. Oops. On April uh, 12, uh, 1918, during one of the international uh, evangelists show at his rallies in Warlord, Beijing, Yao Zhong signed the pledge, which said, I decide to join the church and confess Jesus Christ as my savior. This rally belonged to one of the trips Eddie made for evangelistic campaigns in 1910s China. My talk will be focusing on the conversion of Wu Yaozong, the very beginning of the story of a controversial man who is best known as the most significant Protestant leader in charting the post-1949 framework of church-state relationships in China. Wu's will prove to be one of the most far-reaching conversions in the history of uh, 20th century Chinese Christianity. So how are we to account for uh, Wu's religious conversion historically and to what kind of Christianity was Wu converted? Uh, these are the two questions I would like to address. Borrowing from uh, Luis Rambo's stage model of religious conversion, I make two main arguments. The first is that Wu's conversion should be understood as a process in context, not a sudden event. This process took place in the macro context of two decades of both China's unprecedented opening to Protestantism and 
Western missionary increasing expansion in China at around the same time. Within this optimistic macro context, Wu's twofold networks based on uh, intimate relationships and alumni constituted his micro context to try out a new religious option. I argue, secondly, that what Wu converted to in 1918 was mainly a version of trans-Pacific social Christianity, which while emphasizing the social role of Protestant Christianity in saving the country, did not eschew the evangelical aspects of religion, a term appropriate to conceptualize the particular Christianity Wu embraced can be what theologian Kenneth Cawthon defines as evangelical liberalism, a term that sounds uh, contradictory to us today, but seemed perfectly consistent to many church history figures, such as Walter Rauschenbusch and Harry Emerson Fostick. Wu's first time contact with Christianity dates back to the summer of 1911. Seven, day, seven years prior to his final commitment to Christianity at Eddie's meeting. That summer was to be the very last one for the long-lived Qing Empire, while Wu, an 18-year-old student at the Customs College in Beijing, attended the summer conference for government students held by the Beijing YMCA. Not only did the year 1911 witness the outbreak of China's Republican Revolution and the collapse of Qing, but it also sat in the middle of about a quarter century period that marked China's unprecedented opening to the West in general and to Protestant Christianity in particular. From 1900 to the early 19, uh, 1920s, China seemed to be modernizing and Christianizing at the same time. Alongside, um, China's increasing open-mindedness. Um, the Protestant missionary enterprise in the first two decades of the 20th century gathered the momentum in terms of the numbers of missionaries, uh, missionary societies, mission stations, and church mem membership. Among the missionary agencies uh, pro uh, proliferating in China, the YMCA, which gave a large portion of attention to the Chinese students, had its greatest period of development during this period. John R. Mott and Sherwood Eddy had conducted a series of evangelistic campaigns under the auspices of the YMCA si since 1907. Their campaigns met with an enthusiastic response. Wu's social networks based on intimacy and school then established the um, micro context in 1917 to 18 for Wu's access to Christianity's religious practices, such as Bible reading and praying. Uh, let us look at Wu's intimate relations network first. For about uh, four years from Mott's campaign to early 1917, we know nothing about Wu's continuing contact with Christianity. After attending Mott's Beijing meeting, Wu was assigned to Guangzhou as a customs officer before being reassigned to Niu Zhuang in Liaoning province. Not until August 1917 was Wu reassigned to customs headquarters in Beijing. Christianity related elements resurfaced in Wu's January 1917 diary entry on the gift exchange between his girlfriend and him. Wu recounted how he was touched by his girlfriend Yang Sulan's thoughtfulness for the latter sent off last Christmas a copy of the Bible as a gift to him. It was not the first copy we obtained and read, but Yang's gift helped him resume reading the Bible and even say bedtime prayer time and again. Another network that Wu acknowledged as crucial in connecting him to the YMCA was that of school. Two of Wu's Customs College alumni, Xu Baoqian and Zhang Qingshi, chose to become Beijing YMCA staff upon graduation. They were instrumental in lodging Wu at Beijing YMCA's hostel after Wu was 
reassigned to the customs headquarters. The geographical proximity paved the way for both Wu's personal interaction with Christians, such as Xu and Zhang, and his attending of Bible study and religious lectures organized by the YMCA. Now, um, let us turn to Wu's crisis be before introducing his decisive encounter and interaction with uh, tripartite advocates from the United States. Also essential for Wu's conversion was his drastic Bible reading experience four days before meeting with one of the American advocates. Three levels of personal crisis over the 1910s informed Wu's active quest for a way out. These crises were moral, intellectual, and political in nature. The moral crisis that Wu experienced concerned the issue of gluttony and his failure to overcome it for about a decade from as early as 1908 to as late as 1917. What Wu went through as an intellectual crisis was the struggle over the fundamental questions about cosmos and life. And the political crisis referred to Wu's uh, concern for both China's uh, internal and external dilemmas. The encounter with three American advocates played a substantial part in Wu's road to conversion. The first one of them was none other than John R. Mott, an evangelical ecumenical with a social gospel tendency. In a 1913 lecture to the government students in Beijing about the diagnosis and prescription for youth's uh, carnal desires and bad habits, Mott's message of a call to the struggle for a character reminded Wu of his unsuccessful fighting with gluttony for years. As Wu's diary entry recounted, each word of Mott touched his heart. Wu's breakthrough in the religious experience took place five years later in early 1918. By then, he had been back in Beijing and attended YMCA's religious activities for months. On January 16th, 1918, Wu read for the very first time Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in a Bible study at an American friend's home in Beijing. As Wu recalled years later, these three chapters in Matthew contained marvelous teachings that he had been in quest of for more than a decade. Reading them one more time upon returning to his apartment, Wu could not help but dance uh, with joy and his eyes welled with tears of mixing emotions. The Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is for Wu a charismatic personality who speaks powerful words leaves out his teaching and therefore may be able to put on an end Wu's moral and intellectual crisis. Only four days after this experience, on January 20th, Wu's encounter and personal interaction with Frank Bookman witnessed another dramatic religious experience leading to his final um, commitment. As a YMCA evangelist and to be founder of the Oxford Group Movement, Bookman was involved in Mott and Eddie's YMCA strategy for converting the ruling classes of China in the 1915 to 18 period. Profoundly influenced by the evangelical Catholic holiness experience in 1908, Bookman in his personal work campaigns focused on the necessity of surrender and closeness to Christ and the importance of personal devotions and restitution for sin. In the meantime, he saw the personal soul-saving gospel as a way to bring into reality the social gospel goals. Wu was invited to, book, to Bookman's 1918 personal work meeting in Beijing, deeply touched by Bookman's public message preached during the daytime on January 20th. We invited Bookman for a private 
conversation and talked that evening of his predicaments before another、uh, public meeting immediately ensued. Then, during that evening's public meeting, Wu stood as the first attendee in response to Bookman's call for the public confession of sins. His diary entry went: "I knelt on the ground, weeping loudly for more than ten minutes." Bookman's downplaying of creeds and doctrines, and his emphasis on religious experience and practical living. Convinced Wu of a belief in Jesus as the exclusive qualification for becoming a Christian. Now it was just a matter of time for Wu to proclaim his conversion. This moment of decision came during Eddie's campaign three months later, in April 1918. A YMCA traveling secretary for Asia since 1911. Eddie's social gospel convictions were firmly in place by 1917. Even though he never relinquished the necessity、um, of individual conversion to Christ, Wu's、uh, Eddie's lectures that year on moral salvation for China left their detailed imprint in Wu's diary entry. In the context of the warlord strife and national under Development domestically, as well as the shadow of the Great War internationally, Eddie won Wu over in the belief that personal commitment to Christian God would translate into the transformation of the wider society and the whole nation. Wu's political crisis seemed to be well addressed. April twelfth, nineteen eighteen, then saw Wu's consummation. Of the conversion process that lasted for seven years, Wu's commitment to Christianity had multiple effects. Most importantly, he would make a life-changing career shift by quitting the lucrative custom service job and joining the staff of the Beijing YMCA in 1920. And the story of 20th century Chinese Protestantism was to be different. Thank you all, and I look forward to your comments and questions.、Uh, over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Dr. Wang. All right, so we have some time for questions and comments.、Uh, I have one comment, but I will wait. <laughs> wait for everyone else. So certainly, any questions for for Dr. Wang? I think I'll jump in quickly, and then、uh, if if others are thinking of questions or comments, please please follow up.、Um, I, I'm really struck,、uh, Dr. Wang, by your discussion of this conversion as process. So rather than conversion as a single moment, it's a kind of layered process. It involves social networks. It involves、uh, you know epistolary you know correspondence,、um, and maybe I'm also thinking about、um, Dr. Stassen's presentation.、Um, two questions came to mind: What happened to the girlfriend,、uh, Yang? Uh, was she involved in his life afterward, and did did she play a further role in the conversations that he had in this process? That's one quick question. And and the second question、uh, or comment,、um, I'm, I'm really struck by other kinds of conversion experiences, and、uh, specifically in in non Christian circles. I mean, the the very famous Lu Xun.、Um, Converting or kind of leaving medical school and saying I'm no longer going to be a doctor. I want to be a revolutionary, and then going through this process of becoming a revolutionary. Do you find parallels in the conversion experience of political figures、um, who are not Christian compared to this kind of social gospel conversion? So, two quick questions. Um, um, thank,、uh, thanks, Joseph. Um, Wu and、uh, his girlfriend Yang Sulang got married huh,、uh, years later, um, and um, Yang Sulang、uh, supported Wu's decision、uh, to quit his、um, customs service job, and uh, uh, when he decided whether or not he should join 
um, the YMCA with um, much lower um, uh, with incomes. But uh, uh, Yang Sulan is very supportive of Wu's decision, uh, uh, career decision. And, um, and if you read uh, uh, Wu Yaozong's uh, uh, diaries, uh, fragmented diaries, uh, uh, they lived a quite a uh, happy life, even though sometimes uh, Yang Wu complained about Wu's um, business in, <laughs> in his uh, work uh, in, YM in the YMCA. Um, um, so yes, I would say that uh, um, uh, Yang was very important uh, in uh, Wu's life in terms of uh, uh, his decision to become a Christian as well as uh, his decision um, for his career shift. The second question, mm -hmm. I never thought of that. <laughs> um, I would say that um, those kind of uh, experiences they uh, encountered are a little bit similar, if you may say, uh, like Lu Xun, he saw those um, uh, slides uh, of um, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, that were uh, 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 sent to death uh, by the, uh, the Japanese. And these uh, ex experiences uh, left an imprint uh, on his decision. And I would say that uh, Wu's religious experience also played an important role. Uh, his re uh, he, he said he was a very emotional guy. So you see, he, he he cried uh, uh, when he read the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, he he cried uh, in one of the show Eddie's uh, rallies um, uh, when he heard that uh, uh, Eddie expressed his uh, love for um, China, and I think these kind of emotional responses to uh, the events at hand uh, they played. A role in their conversion to uh, whatever um, religion or uh, uh, revolutionary uh, cause uh, they uh, they will uh, support. Excellent, thank you, uh, Dr. Clark. Just a very short question. You know, uh, Wu Yaozong is famous for being very socially active, even political in his theology. How how much would you say his personal Christian manifestation was influenced by the saving the nation ideas of the May 4th movement, the Wu Su Yun Dong. Um, pardon me, uh, Dr. Krak, uh, could you say your question again? So how much do you think Wu Yao Zong's Christian um, practice or his uh, theology was influenced by the May 4th movement, the Wu Su Yun Dong? Mm -hmm. the, the idea of the saving the nation that was espoused from that movement in 1919. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, when we read uh, Wu Yaozong's uh, diaries, uh, it was it's very obvious that uh, uh, he he loved his his country very much uh, in his uh, early life earlier life uh, um, when he would attend attended uh, the customs college in Beijing. And uh, he did not personally involved, I think, uh, in the May 4th movement um, at that time because he was no longer a student uh, in 1919. But um, uh, the May 4th movement, I think, did play a role in his decision um, in becoming a religious worker instead of a, a, a customs uh, service clerk. And um, uh, after 1919, uh, it was a period when he seriously considered quitting his job. And um, another thing is, uh, uh, Wu, uh, along with uh, other uh, Christian intellectuals in Beijing, uh, they would uh, initiate uh, several publications, um, progressive, liberal, and um, publications, um, periodicals actually, um, uh, in the 
aftermath of the 1919. And I think, um, yeah, all of, all of uh, earlier uh, things uh, we had done uh, were um, uh, a manifestation of his uh, love uh, for nation and his patriotism, as well as I think uh, his um, manifestation of um, his um, YMCA religion, um, um, a social gospel uh, uh, theology that um, uh, we should uh, usher in uh, the kingdom of God on earth in China. Excellent. And I think there's a interesting, you know, use of phrasing, right? A religious worker. Um, because I think about the Christian manifesto that we later signs on to as this kind of you know, combining the, the labor of the kind of political imagination with religious work um, and, and conversion. So anyway, really, really interesting. I was also temporarily distracted by a feline participant in Dr. Clark's window. Uh, but certainly, uh, just in the interest of time, you know, if other questions um, arise, please reach out to Dr. Wong and we can continue conversations from there. So now I'd like to welcome Jennifer Lin, who is a longtime reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, the author of Shanghai Faithful, and also the director of the, an excellent documentary, Beethoven in Beijing. Uh, and Jennifer will be speaking on the Watch Me Ni exhibit at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC. Jennifer. Yes, thank you very much. And it's a real privilege to uh, address the study group. Um, you know, I've, I've met many of you, I've consulted and benefited from the scholarship of many of you. And if I could just shout out my two advisors on this family memoir that I wrote, Joseph Lee and uh, his wife, Christy Cho, were very helpful to me. And in addition, uh, Jushi Wang was very helpful in, in helping me to locate some documents. Um, but before I tell you about the, the new development at the Museum of the Bible, just a little bit about my work and my family memoir that I wrote. So Shanghai Faithful came out a few years ago and it's a look at the uh, five generations of my family. And for the study group, uh, you would find uh, my family story very interesting, I think, because it really is a microcosm of how uh, the, the Protestant uh, denomination has evolved in China because my grandfather, uh, the Reverend Lin Buji, was an Anglican priest. Uh, and he you know, went through the Anglican educational system, graduated from St. John's University, went to seminary in Philadelphia, and then returned to Shanghai. Uh, and his brother-in-law, my father's uh, great uncle, was Watchman Nee. So within this one family, you have really uh, two examples of how Protestantism took hold in China. Uh, but the main focus is really on the Lin family. And uh, we are originally from Fujian province. And so in writing uh, a family history, a family memoir, I go back five generations um, and I tell my story uh, as narrative nonfiction. I am not a scholar. I am a journalist, a reporter, uh, formerly with the Philadelphia Inquirer. I left the paper about five years ago, but I was a correspondent in China. And so what I wanted to do was really to tell a story of a family. So I go back to Fujian province, you know, with the first convert who was a, a fisherman who went to work for the missionaries in Fuzhou as a cook. And his only son was trained as a doctor uh, by the missionaries uh, in Fuzhou. And the doctor's eldest son was my grandfather, Lin Buji. Uh, and he went to Philadelphia uh, to, to go to seminary as well as to go to the University of Pennsylvania to study philosophy. Uh, and he left uh, China in September 1918, arrived in Philadelphia just as the pandemic was breaking out. And little did I know as I was writing my book that I would understand in a more full way what a pandemic was all about. But anyway, my grandfather was part of that 1918 generation that wanted to change China by getting an education. He had every intention of spending as long as he could in the United States and getting a PhD uh, from Penn. But two years into his studies, he was summoned home for an arranged marriage. Uh, and, you know, he was really torn between 
pursuing, uh, you know, his his academics in the United States or being the dutiful son uh, and following Confucian tradition and returning to Fuzhou. So he uh, opted to do what was expected of him. And he went back to Fuzhou to marry um, my grandmother, whom he barely knew. And she was the older sister of Watchman Nee. So through this marriage, the Lin and the Nee families, uh, you know, be became joined. Uh, so my, my grandfather really uh, was very prominent within Anglican circles. Uh, he moved to Shanghai. He was the assistant pastor of St. Peter's Church. Uh, he was editor of the Chinese Churchman, and he was uh, the principal of the School for Chinese Boys, which was uh, run by the Shanghai municipality. Meanwhile, uh, in Shanghai at the same time was his brother-in-law, Watchman Ni, who was a frequent visitor to the Lin family home. And I think many people might be surprised to know uh, that Watchman Ni and my grandfather were friends. Uh, they, I think, appreciated each other's intellect, although they followed very different paths. And Watchman Nee, as you as you all know, you know, was uh, you know instrumental in the house church movement, uh, the indigenous church movement in China. And uh, in 1949, it's estimated that there were about 80,000 followers of his uh, across China. He was a you know well known writer and teacher. But within the, the Lin family, this uh, Watchman Nee caused a lot of problems. And Annika, you, you'd be interested in this because um, my grandmother was very much drawn to the Christian assembly in Shanghai. Now, she was the organist for my grandfather's church, St. Peter's, and she decided to no longer go to his church. Uh, and to instead attend the Christian assembly of her brother. So this caused huge problems within the family. I mean, my, uh, my father and his brothers and, and his sister recall, you know, heated arguments, uh, knock down, drag out fights between my grandparents over what she would do. And she basically stood up to him. She said, no, I, I no longer want to go to your church. I don't want to listen to your sermons. You're, you, you are a very dry speaker. I, I am much more drawn to my brother's assembly. So she uh, defied him and went to the assembly of, of her brother. Um, within the family, this caused problems. Uh, and my father tells the story about how every Sunday, the three boys would go to uh, St. Peter's Church with their father. And my Aunt Martha would go to the Christian Assembly with her mother uh, to hear Watchman Nee. So, you know, uh, this is familiar to many of you, what happened to Watchman Nee after 1949. He was arrested in 1952. Uh, on trumped up economic crimes. He was accused of being a spy and uh, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison and in a labor camp. Um, for my grandfather, um, this was tragic. Um, you know, it was guilt by association. And from really from like 1952 on, he was stripped of all of his church responsibilities. Um, he was accused of being an American spy, an enemy of the people. And basically, you know, at the young age of 60 something, he, his only job was babysitting his grandchildren. So uh, for the family, you know, as you could well imagine, uh, the Cultural Revolution were, was a horrific time, and my grandmother in particular was, was persecuted because she would not renounce her brother Watchman Nate. So um, in, in writing my book, uh, you know, as in the closing of, of the book, I, I revisited uh, Fujian province to, to kind of gauge the legacy of, of both Watchman Nee and my grandfather, and I was happy to see that my grandfather's church in Fuzhou was still standing, although they were tearing down everything around it. And with Watchman Nee, um, you know, I attended uh, a couple of house church gatherings and I was quite surprised at the relative openness of the little flock uh, in Fuzhou. Now, I, I, I say that with, you know, with the caveat that this was 2015. And I have no idea what the situation is today, but at least in 2015, 
you know, there, there was, there was a degree of openness. Um, but what I'd really like to tell the group about now is uh, a new development. So the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC on March the 15th avail, uh, unveiled uh, a new exhibit to Watchman Nate. And this is part of their program that they have of highlighting individuals, uh, profiling individuals who were, whose lives were changed by the Bible. So on March the 5th, they had this big opening ceremony. Um, you know, the, the exhibit takes up a corner of, of part of the, the Museum of the Bible, and it includes uh, many photographs, um, some archival things like a, a fountain pen that Watchman Nee used. There's a video uh, interview with the, the man who was his jailmate at the labor camp in Anhui province. Um, I found out about this, um, their intentions of mounting a, an exhibit about, it was in the summer of uh, 2021 when uh, some people from the uh, museum came to my home and they were interested in my archival material. Um, I, um, I connected, when I was doing research for my book, I connected with the family of Angus Kinnear. Uh, he was a biographer of Watchman Nee in 1972, uh, published Against the Tide, which was uh, the first English language biography of the life of Watchman Nee. And I remember, you know, as I was doing my research on my family memoir, I, I located the family in, in England and I asked them like, what university did your father leave his archives? And the daughter of Angus Kinnear said, they're in a box in my garage. So if you wanna come, come over and take a look. So the family actually shared with me um, a lot of the, the materials of Angus Kinnear and entrusted them to me with the stipulation that uh, you know any academic who was interested in in seeing what was what they had uh, you know I was to make it available and just you know if you could all just file this away that I I do have this material um, including many photographs so for the museum of the the bible exhibit they use many of the Kinnear uh, photos uh, including this you know the very famous one of uh, you know Watchman Nee the the portrait so. The, the exhibit, I think, is very significant. Um, ostensibly, it's to mark the 50th anniversary of the death of Watchman Nee. Um, and it's significant because it will introduce, you know, a general American Christian public with the life of Watchman Nee, who we all know was one of the, you know, leading Chinese Christians of the 20th century. But I, I think this, the exhibit is significant, though, uh, for uh, people in China um, who follow the writings of Watchman Nee as well as Witness Lee, Nee, excuse me, Witness Lee. Um, because having such a uh, uh, prominent exhibit at such uh, a prominent mainstream museum helps uh, add legitimacy uh, to the followers of Watchman Nee in China, because as you, many of you well know, um, the people who follow Witness Lee, uh, they're dubbed the shouters, they were labeled uh, a cult. And so for many decades, the, the people in China have been trying to climb out from under that, that label and, uh, you know, when I was in Fuzhou doing research for my book and meeting with the house church members, they were telling me that there was a concerted effort beginning in 2003 to really come out into the open, not to, to uh, you know, practice uh, in, in the shadows because they wanted to remove the stigma of being a cult. And this uh, language is from the uh, press release that the Museum of the Bible sent out, uh, mentioning that, you know, Anyone who wants can get a complimentary copy of Watchman Nee's Normal Christian Life, and Chinese-speaking visitors to the museum will receive a copy of the Chinese recovery version of the Bible. So um, uh, the exhibit will be up for a year, and it's the intention of the museum to then uh, lend it out to other universities, perhaps, 
uh, who want to, to then uh, stage the exhibit. So uh, really that is all I have to say. And I'm going to actually ask Joseph Lee and Christy Cho who were also at the uh, unveiling of the exhibit to add anything uh, if they'd like uh, about the significance of this exhibit. And thank you all very much for letting me tell you about it. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> yes, uh, Dr. Lee or Dr. Chow, if you'd like to jump in. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, Jennifer, I think you cover, you know, all the ground. Um, I, the only thing I would add is I think there was also a strong input uh, coming from the Living Stream Ministry in California. Um, I think you know during that opening events, you also had a very strong presence of the members of the local church across you know North America. Um, so it was a kind of joint effort. Uh, and I guess that I think for the Living Stream, they were also much more concerned about the representation, the Chinese official representations of their group as a cult, as problematic. Um, so I think they were also trying to use this exhibition uh, to bring them you know, into the mainstream of the global Christianity as well. Uh, but, but I guess it was quite significant in the sense that it was actually the first uh, in the United States to see a public exhibitions of Watchman Lee. Um, so it was an educational experience uh, for myself and also for many people who know very little about uh, the story of Watchman Lee. Um, and, and also I think on that day, um, I think during the opening ceremony, um, I think Mr. Uh, Wu Yao Qi, uh, who was actually the cellmate of Watchman Lee uh, in the prison and also in the labor camp, uh, he also came to the events and also shared his story as well. Uh, I think what he did was he also donated some of the personal items uh, that was actually belonged to Watchman Lee. Uh, and I don't know about the final arrangement, uh, but most of those items uh, are now on display in the museum as well. Uh, so I guess um, it also gives people a sense of to understand Watchman Lee as a person, a private individual uh, who care a lot about his, um, you know, writing and, and even, you know, how to take care of his own body. Um, I think one interesting story was, you know, Watchman Lee liked to trim his own hair, you know, inside the prison. Um, so, um, it, so it also reflects some interesting story about Watchman Lee, you know, how, he, how did he present himself, uh, you know, within the camp and also within the prison uh, to other cellmates and also to other Chinese officials as well. Um, yeah, I highly recommend, and um, this is actually one of the most um, informative and also a very emotional exhibitions that I have ever seen on a Chinese uh, Christian individual. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I think it's a interesting, also really kind of moving reminder about the, the materials that we study and the people that we study and kind of moving through the you know, multiple levels of, you know, individual identity of trauma, uh, also between the state and families and materials ending up in, you know, in, in garages and closets or archives and institutions. Um, there's, there's a really rich story there and, you know, certainly something to, to kind of think about. And in the interest of time and speaking about archives, um, last but not least, we'd like to move on to Mark Mir uh, of the Ricci Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History, now uh, freshly at Boston College. Uh, and uh, Dr. Xiaoxin Wu was uh, going to join us tonight, but had to uh, bow out due to personal um, um, commitments. But uh, Mark, the um, floor is all yours. Thank you. So, uh, sorry for the hiccup. Uh, uh, Dr. Wu and Father Usler uh, were not able to be here tonight, so they asked me to give a brief presentation of the move of the Ricci Institute from USF to Boston College. Uh, as you can see, I hope you can see the screen in front of in front of you here. This picture was actually taken before the renovations uh, began, uh, just about one year ago. Uh, and those, most of those renovations have now been completed. So the building, although the general structure looks very similar, uh, there's now a wheel, uh, wheelchair access ramp and the 
grounds look quite different and there's been uh, upgrades and improvements in the old building, which is the old Cray Library, which used to be the Archdiocese of Boston's archives, uh, in fact. Uh, this is the uh, recently installed uh, photo, uh, pictures uh, that we have in this rotunda area. It's like an atrium as you walk in the, the room. Uh, and um, as you can see, we've, for those of you who have been seeing the Research Institute in San Francisco, you will recognize many of our paintings and holdings that uh, have found a new home here. Uh, the boxing up of the Institute began in January uh, 2022. It took four weeks uh, working with Iron Mountain uh, Library Movers. And in March, uh, the collection was trucked across country and uh, in about two weeks time was installed. Uh, and uh, we're now more or less up and running. Uh, this will give you a little bit of an idea of some of the materials, how the rooms look. Those of you who remember Lone Mountain will remember it fondly. Um, these rooms are different, but they have their own charms. And you can see we have on the left here a conference room. We now have room to uh, display many items that were where we didn't have room in Lone Mountain. For example, you can see in the corner that enormous credenza that was uh, carved at the Xu Jiahui uh, Orphanage Workshop uh, and had been sent to San Francisco uh, for the 1915 Panama Pacific Exhibition. We actually have quite a number of artifacts from that exhibition uh, now on display in the Ricci Institute. Uh, the rooms on the side that are called seminar rooms are actually the rooms uh, where I work and where most of the visitors will, will stay. But we uh, not shown in this slide uh, show are the uh, second floor offices. So there'll be uh, quiet private offices for visiting scholars, professors and so on, who will prefer to have a little more uh, quiet. Uh, the first public lecture was just held on May 4th by, by Professor Anthony Clark, who's with us tonight. Uh, he officially inaugurated uh, uh, the arrival of Boston College with our first, uh, first ex uh, exhibition in open house. Uh, we, we were planning on having our uh, travel, uh, summer uh, 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 doctoral and postdoctoral fellowships, the Luce Foundation fellowships from June to August. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, all the background data on all of our uh, attendees, but there are going to be, I think 14 or 15. So it'll be a very large group uh, coming this summer these uh, photographs of them. Uh, and I'm sorry, again, I don't have all of their names and information. Dr. Wu did not uh, provide me with the, the finalists on, on the list. Uh, we are hosting, as, as you can see, panel uh, International Symposium on Jesuit Studies in August 2022. Uh, Joseph Ho, uh, Yin Pang, Liu Yifu, uh, and Wang Chuying will be present for these uh, presentations. And look forward to welcoming them, welcoming them all uh, this summer. Uh, we are continuing with our historical legacies of Christianity in East Asia. This is a workshop uh, that is uh, dedicated to mentoring uh, doctoral students who wish to turn their 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 dissertations into publications. And this uh, this year, we hope to hold it at Seoul National University. This had originally been planned for 2020, but because of the pandemic, we had to postpone it for two years. Uh, so we're just now catching up uh, with this program. Uh, we'll continue our real monograph series, Studies in the History of Christianity in East Asia. Um, some of you are familiar with this, uh, this series. So these are three of our more recent publications. Uh, um, the, by Alan Sweeten, Julia Falato, and Gabriele Tola. Uh, again, we're, we are, Steve Ford is still the editor of this series. And uh, for anyone interested, Dr. Wu would be happy to talk to you about these publications. Now, the library itself, what you saw in the pictures is primarily the pretty end, uh, where all the pretty books and where the visitors go. There's a lot of stacks areas in the new building, two floors of them, in fact. So we have room now for uh, all of our overflow that uh, at Little Mountain was stuffed in boxes or tucked away and not uh, easily accessible. It look, looks like we have room for most, uh, most materials here. Uh, and uh, as you can see, there's, there were 2,600 boxes uh, worth of materials that were sent from 
California to Boston. And uh, most of them are now on shelves. Some of them, uh, the, uh, the delicate materials are still boxed for protection, uh, but slowly I'm going through all of them and putting them on shelves. Also, you'll notice that on the, in the, one of the pictures here, there are smaller offices. There are six of these uh, in the stacks area, and each one holds a special archive uh, the, with the rare books collection, the Canton Diocesan archives, and uh, special collections and gifts like Professor Clark's donations of his archives will have their own uh, with their own rooms. The rooms are all climate controlled, uh, fire protection, and they're in much uh, better conditions than they were previously. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Clark was the first, gave, uh, gave us our first uh, new collections of the new building, which uh, a little sample you can see here, uh, the works of uh, Celso Costantini, uh, and a beautiful edition of Fabi's uh, Peking, uh, including the Chinese translation. We have only a very poor copy uh, in our archives, and uh, Professor Clark is very generously donating these materials piece by piece. Uh, we also uh, received about a thousand volumes from the Henry Luce Foundation uh, from their back catalog. Uh, I guess they're moving to new buildings and they wanted to find a proper home for some of their editions. And you have here a sample of uh, some of the uh, donations that we have uh, that will be added to the collection. And uh, this will, for Joseph, <laughs> for Joseph Hull, while we were cleaning out uh, the, the collection, we finally uncovered uh, boxes of negatives of many thousands, uh, well over 10,000 uh, photographs from the Frederick Foley collection uh, that, jo that I'm sure Joseph will enjoy uh, inspecting at his leisure when he visits. Uh, we're migrating a lot of our data. Uh, the old library catalog is going to be retired. We're going to move it to a new uh, state-of-the-art uh, library, which will have much faster searching, full text for many more materials, and will be uh, updated without dependencies. And it's just from our old standard query language uh, catalog. We'll try to uh, keep all of our uh, descriptive catalog uh, intact. Uh, there's a beta in pro uh, running right now. We'll probably go live in about two weeks. Uh, and this is a view of the building shot from the hillside right uh, near the McMullen Art Museum. And uh, I just want to uh, say thank you for your time and welcome you all, uh, I hope, to the Ricci Institute someday. Thank you so much, Mark. And I think it's wonderful that we're essentially bookending tonight's gathering with these discussions of possibilities, uh, other archives, and um, having worked with the Ricci for many years, I highly encourage anyone uh, who's interested to, to reach out to Mark and Dr. Wu um, in regards to materials. They're now in a wonderful new space. And also to, to reemphasize also, if you're interested in Watchman Nee, to please reach out to Jennifer, um, because it's not every day that one says, I have found an archive and it is sitting in my house. So um, certainly for, for both the Ricci and, and for, for Jennifer, please um, you know, do, do reach out. Um, so in terms of time, I think we have a time, just five minutes, it's for uh, final questions for um, for Jennifer, for Mark, um, and for any one of our presenters tonight before we move over to the business meeting portion of the gathering. So I'll open the floor now to anyone who has questions or comments. Stephanie. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I was so intrigued by the, the presentations in Watchman Nee and also by the possibility of family conflict in the midst of it. Um, on the Protestant side of my family, my grandmother had grown up in Watchman Nee's church in Shanghai, but her dad was a kind of combination of a traditional Confucian elite in that he was very traditional in some ways and had a, a concubine and, and other children, but he was also the owner of this dance hall, the Paramount Dance, dance Hall in Shanghai. And so I had this kind of art deco, modern man ethos as well. And so um, I know that for the women in the family who went to Watchman Nee's church, his message of monogamy was really important. 
as they were very ashamed as, as Christians that he wasn't Christian and that he wasn't um, monogamous in the marriage. So I don't know what to make of that. It's just a family anecdote, but I was intrigued by when you were talking about the wife, Jennifer, going to a different church than her husband. I think in my own family's history, it was the same case that it was the woman going alone to watch Manise church. So I wonder if there's a pattern there. Hmm. Yeah, um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, if there's a pattern. Joseph, do you know? Joseph's a, also, you know, very much a Watchman Nee scholar. No, I think it's interesting. Um, no, I think, I, I think what, you know, Stephanie shared, I think is a fascinating story because um, I, I think that kind of family division or disagreement, you know, over faith practice or ethical practice, uh, it, it seems to be a common problem in many second generations of the Christian family during the Republican era. Um, so I guess, you know, today's presentation, it actually get us to think more about the gender dynamics and also maybe the gender tension as well, uh, you know, during the Republican period and also maybe later during the 50s and 60s. Um, I think when all the institutional church are gone, um, I think the story was, it was actually the woman who helped to maintain the faith, you know, within the family domain. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for that. Really, in, in sharing this kind of family background and also asking this question, and I, I'm also thinking about all the different times that I've come across, either in my own family experience or my research, where it's, it's women who are the ones who convert first and then build kind of social networks and religious networks through their families from there. And I keep coming back to this um, phrase that a missionary writes in actually writing about movie films that this person is shooting. Um, and then she is a female missionary, makes these films, sh shows them to Chinese Christian women. And then the question is what to do about the men because they're not the ones coming to see the movies. It's the women who are coming to see the movies and joining the church. So, you know, how those networks work and the tensions involved, I mean, it's just an excellent question. So again, Dr. Stassen, I think this is something that I'm sure your, your, your project um, would be able to kind of uh, shed more light on. Um, but yes, excellent questions and, and comments here. Other thoughts in the last couple minutes we have before we switch over to the business meeting. I will say that I cannot um, kind of underscore the excitement enough of the Ricci Institute um, being in this new home. And uh, as Mark mentioned, you know, discovering in the moving process, a lot of material that is, I'm sure of great interest to not, not just me, but every, a lot of everyone else here. Um, and, and just kind of, you know, encouraging uh, all of us here to be able to make a use of those resources at the Ricci that are now in this wonderful new place. Um, well, the, the, uh... The, the, the negatives that you had been looking for uh, apparently were had been sent either to Father Ed uh, sometime in years past, maybe before I even got there. We were cleaning out the rare book cabinet and underneath the, the cabinet, which is a very odd shaped cabinet, we found way in the back where you couldn't see them, these wrapped cellophane and, and, and plastic wrap and stuff. And it was like a, this very treasure. And it turned out to be those missing negatives that you've been looking for for many years. Um, and none of us had any idea they were there. <laughs> Jennifer uses an interesting phrase, uh, media archeologist. <laughs> I, I borrowed that phrase and Mark, I have to say, you are truly a media archeologist. And I, I really have been looking for those negatives for, for years and years and despairing that they've been, been somehow lost to the Pacific or something. But I hope others can also make use of this, these excellent materials, both you know, physical materials, but also looping back the, the CHCD and the digital materials and networks that we're also thinking about tonight. So uh, really briefly, before we switch over to the business meeting, um, I just want to thank all of you again for being here today. And just to uh, uh, let us know that um, you know, for the next meeting of the Association for Asian Studies, I believe it's gonna be in Boston in 2023, um, the whole goal is to have us in person 
Um, and, and again, it's been wonderful to kind of reach out to people across space and time using uh, this technology, but it'd be great to see many of you uh, in person. The goal is to have that meeting uh, together physically um, at Boston for the Association for Asian Studies gathering in uh, the spring of 2023. So, um, and yes, if Jennifer, Jennifer's putting this in the chat now, um, certainly if you would like to look at the Kinnear papers, um, Jennifer is putting her email now in the chat box. And if you're also looking at the chat box, um, Dr. Ferris has also put in the link to the business meeting, which will now begin. And if, uh, if you are interested in joining, we are um, nominating and electing a new leadership for the CCSG. This is my last, well, my last meeting as the director, and this is the last meeting um, with uh, Dr. Ferris being the assistant director. So um, if you know anyone, including yourself, um, that would like to serve for CCSG leadership, um, we'll pop on over to the meeting um, and uh, kind of continue from there. <laughs>